Questions for Reflection. Our first reading presents us with two excerpts from the selection of a replacement for Judas, the one who betrayed the Lord. It tells us much about the structure of the early church and the special role that Peter played among the apostles. The initiative for replacing Judas, so that the number of apostles remained as 12, came from Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Just as Israel had 12 tribes, this new Israel, the church, the body of Christ, has 12 apostles. Luke reserves the term apostles for the 12 as we see in the sixth chapter of the book, when the 12 prayed and laid their hands on, thereby ordaining the first deacons of the church. He also shows the special place given to Peter early on, as evident in Acts chapter 2 and verse 14. Peter, standing with the 11, it says, speaks publicly on their behalf. The structure of the church is not something unimportant. In fact, it was led of the Holy Spirit. Within the first two centuries, we will see the orders of the Sacrament of Holy Orders clearly evident, bishop, priest, and deacon. The church is God's loving plan for the whole human race. In its treatment of the church, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, citing the scriptures, St. Augustine and St. Ambrose explains, and I quote, to reunite all his children scattered and led astray by sin. The Father willed to call the whole of humanity together into his Son's church. The church is the place where humanity must rediscover its unity and salvation. The church is the world reconciled. She is that bark which, in the full sail of the Lord's cross by the breath of the Holy Spirit, navigates safely in this world. Continues, According to another image dear to the church, Father, she is prefigured by Noah's Ark, which alone saves from the flood. That's paragraph 845. How do we view the church? Do we believe that she has been ordered, structured, and built by the Lord? Of course, until the Lord returns, this church is still composed of human members, and thus she's both human and divine. She's wounded and in need of healing. However, she's the means through which we participate in the very life of God and the balm for the healing of the nations. To her has been entrusted the sacraments and the word, the gift of a teaching office and the very means of salvation. The church is the body of Christ. The church is not some optional extra that we add on to our own lives. She is our life now because we live in Christ from whose wounded side she was birthed at the tree of Calvary, the altar for the new world. Through faith we are invited daily more deeply into this mystery, and it is by grace that we begin to comprehend it and live it. To love the Lord is to love the church. The psalmist sings in our responsorial psalm for today's Holy Mass, Supreme over all the nations is Yahweh, supreme over the heavens his glory. Who is like Yahweh our God? His throne is set on high, but he stoops to look down on heaven and earth. This sovereignty of God is an essential part of the faith. Nations will come and go. Only the kingdom of God is eternal. So how do we understand the kingdom of God? The phrase kingdom of God can also be translated reign of God in English. I've always found that translation very helpful. In Jesus Christ, the reign of God has already come and is coming. It will come in its fullness only upon his glorious return. In the interim, we are invited to live in, anticipate, and spread that kingdom. And we do so most fruitfully when we live in the heart of the church, which is a seed of the kingdom for the sake of the world. In the back of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, there's a glossary with a helpful summary of the phrase, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. It contains citations to the sections in the Catechism which break open the deep meaning of the phrase. And I quote, Kingdom of God of heaven, the reign or rule of God. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God draws near in the coming of the incarnate word. It is announced in the gospel. It is the messianic kingdom present in the person of Jesus the Messiah. It remains in our midst in the Eucharist. And it continues. Christ gave to his apostles the work of proclaiming the kingdom and through the Holy Spirit forms his people into a priestly kingdom, the church, 
in which the kingdom of God is mysteriously present, for she is the seed and beginning of the kingdom on earth. In the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, we pray for its final glorious appearance, when Christ will hand over the kingdom to His Father. So this kingdom, this reign of God has already come. It is coming. And when the King returns, it will be finally and fully revealed. In its dogmatic constitution on the church, Lumen Gentium, which means light to the nations, the Second Vatican Council affirmed the teaching of Jesus Christ, the clear teaching and witness of the early church, and the consistent teaching of church councils throughout the ages. Holiness of life is not an option for any member of the church. We are all called to Christian perfection. And I quote, all the faithful, whatever their condition or state, are called by the Lord, each in his own way, to that perfect holiness whereby the Father himself is perfect. And that's in paragraph 11 of Lumen Gentium. The Catechism of the Catholic Church reminds us, and I quote, all Christians in any state or walk of life are called to the fullness of Christian life and to the perfection of charity. All are called to holiness. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Christians are saved from sin, death, and separation from God through Jesus Christ. We are called for holy living. We are to live differently beginning right now because we live our lives right now in Jesus. We are to love differently because we are capacitated by grace to love in Jesus and with His love. And all of this is made possible as we cooperate with grace, the character of Christ being formed in us as we cooperate with grace. Our gospel passage chosen for today's Mass reminds us that the Lord first chose us and we respond. He calls us to live in Him and allow Him to live His life through us, reaching out to all men and women. And we can do that if we remain in His love.